sometimes real. We are joined in the committee room by Limerick football manager Morris Horn, Galway hurler David Collins, and Dennis Walsh of the Sunday Times. Morris, first of all, hard luck with that performance and that result against Kerry, but you can't really legislate with classic goals like Darren O'Sullivan. Yeah, it, it was a great finish, in fairness to him. Um, you know, it's just a pity happened against us in, in, in Crow Park, but, uh, you know, hats off to him. It was, it was a special finish. Now, I know you're a Mayo man, but what has changed in Mayo when you consider the performance against London in Ryslip and now they're in an All-Ireland semi-final? I think the first game in Ryslip was, um, you know, the first time that management team got together a new panel and... You know, it took a, it took a wobble that day, but I think with the you know the the kind of championship, it wasn't a very it was a kind of strange kind of championship. No one really stood out from a you know it wasn't a, uh, a provincial championship full of confidence or anything like that. Mm. Teams that weren't showing too much confidence, but Mayo got over. And I think they got a lot of confidence from it. And no one really knew what Mayo were like coming into Crow Park because they were playing in such atrocious conditions. And mm. next thing, all of a sudden, they just let go in Crow Park and opened up, and it was it was um, it was great stuff to watch. Once they settled into the game after about 20 minutes, it was brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff for a Mayo man, but for a Corkman, Dennis Walsh, not so good. What, what's, what went wrong with Cork? Was it complacency? It's hard to say, Marty. I'm sure there was some element of, some element of that. I think that's impossible to, to rule out. I mean, I think given the way they'd played against Down the previous week, given Mayo's form all summer, you know, it was hard to believe that Cork didn't feel that, that this was a game that they should win and would win handily. The first 10, 15 minutes, it seemed as if they were just, you know, that they could coast away. But mm. certainly in the second half, I mean, Mayo's defensive system was really good. They, they, had, they had Cork worked out, they had Paddy Kelly tied up, Cork's best playmaker. Uh, Donald O'Connor wasn't getting the supply that he got in the first half and against Down last week. And with the, with the guys that Cork were missing, I think it was always going to tell at some stage. I mean, it's all very well saying that Cork have a great panel, which they have had for the last few years, but still there are certain guys that you need on the pitch and certain guys that are better maybe coming on and so on. And I think Cork just, it was one game maybe too many this year, last Sunday. Let me get your opinions on something else, because it was noticeable that a lot of players were slipping and sliding in Croke Park. Did you notice that, Dennis, and what's your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, I think I thought it was the biggest issue. I mean, obviously, the square ball was a big issue last weekend, but I, I thought the biggest issue was the surface. Um, More so than the square ball? Oh, ah, yeah. I mean, like, for, for, for a, a major game, for a quarter-final doubleheader in Crow Park, for players to be slipping and sliding on one of the biggest days of the year, you know, helplessly at times, you know, I mean, uh, there was no score which I can remember which came directly from a slip. But, you know, there was a possibility of a cornerback slipping and a goal being scored and a game being influenced by the surface. Now, that was an issue three or four years ago. I can recall before one all and hurling final, real controversy and real concern that the game would be influenced unduly by the surface. And here we are, first weekend of August, all the biggest games of the year ahead of us, and the surface, again, an issue. But I'm saying, uh, the, the, from a player's point of view, it's very hard to judge what stood to where going into Crow Park. Mm. Like the surface is, is rock solid underneath them. There's a great surface of grass there, but the stud won't stay. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And then when you're wearing blades, mm -hmm. it just doesn't work either because you're, you're sliding all over the place. And as you said, it's so you're liable to give away a foul at a, at a crucial point of time. And you just can't have that. And I think the surface of last year was very, was totally inappropriate to the game. It was yeah, not good for players. Confidence wise, everything. Do you know? From your perspective as being Limerick manager, did you notice it? Yeah, definitely. I, know, I noticed a couple of our players. When, especially when we were attacking in the second half, just slipped at crucial stages. All of a sudden, then they were on the ground, surrounded by three, three or four carry players, and they were being put under pressure. And you know, all those little things add up to a team like Limerick. You know, mm. um, you know, you don't want any knocks to the confidence. You need the look, like yeah. you need the look. You, you know, look yeah. and you need everything going your way. If yeah. you slip, as you said before, yeah. if you slip and give away that that crucial ball and there's three lads on top of you, yeah. the ref is going to blow for a free for either touching yeah. on the ground or something like that, something silly. So You, you take a pop pass and you're going to full yeah. pace and all of a sudden you're slipping, you know, it really takes a sting out of it. You're, you're on the back foot, a team like Kerry, then they're going to counter-attack. And, and yeah. is, is this a big issue considering what, we are, what we're facing this weekend, Dublin against Tyrone? Waterford I think it's a bigger Kilkenny? issue than the square ball issue, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, the forecast is bad for the weekend, Marty. The forecast is for rain, Saturday and Sunday. If we're faced with the same thing again, guys slipping, I can recall before the 06 hurling final, it was such a big issue that they grew the grass longer than ideal for hurling. And if you remember that game, there were so many throw-ins, so many bash balls because the ball was getting stuck mm. uh, in rocks, basically. I mean, they've worked so hard on the, on the surface. And it, it wasn't an issue for, for the last two or three years, but it was certainly last weekend. And there is a new surface as a result of the mm. Take That concert, isn't that right? That's right, yeah. And uh, I mean, standing on the, on the surface uh, at the weekend, it looked fantastic. It looked, per it looked perfect. And even the players that were slipping, they were all wearing the different types of boots. It wasn't just blades or mole, it was all different types of boots. They were just all slipping. Mm. Yes. The this ground is so hard to penetrate, that's the problem. As a player, you find that, uh, it's, it's like It's like walking on glass, you know what I mean, when you're standing there. Just, the studs won't stick. And that's, I don't know how they're going to approach that. 
whether it's like you don't see it in soccer matches or in any any major pitches. Mm -hmm. You nearly see pitches being dug up on mm -hmm. a soccer game when they slide for a tackle. Crow Park is not dug up. What about the square ball? I mean, do you think now that this latest incident will force the GA to bring in a video referee or technology? Well, yeah. I mean, there's certainly resistance, I think, to the video referee still and to the Hawkeye and so on uh, on various grounds. I mean, I think they need to move in that direction. Now, uh, it emerged in, in the last 24 hours that they're going to move certainly to look at the square ball in terms of the rule itself. Uh, mm. There was a facility came in at Congress in April uh, to establish a rules committee that can bring a recommendation to Congress next year, and that rules committee will in, will include players and managers, which I think is you know is a fantastic initiative, and you know because these are the guys who it affects directly. Um, I think they can't leave it unchanged. I think the square ball rule as it is is ungovernable. I don't think it's reasonable to ask umpires to make a call like that, a split second a split second call, mm. that is that even you know cameras on TV can't necessarily adjudicate. So I think they're going to have to. You know, you're, you're moderate the rule. Hurling, hurling ball coming in there, fifty or sixty miles an hour, even less. Like, it's, you need a TV to do that. Yeah. The tennis ball in, in Wimbledon doesn't travel that fast, so yeah. I think it has to come in. Well, clearly, there's a momentum. Let's see what <laughs> happens, uh, guys. Now, this weekend sees the first of the All Ireland hurling semi-finals, with many predicting a Tipperary Kilkenny final as a foregone conclusion. That issue was on the mind of award-winning author and journalist Christy O'Connor as he went in search of his own All Ireland in the Cooley Mountains. This is the playground of Cucullin, the very first hurler, and I'm following in his footsteps in the All-Ireland Puck Father competition. Tramping over these hills, trying to hit this thing as far as I can, I have plenty of time to think. <laughs> Like everybody else, I can't see anything other than a tip Kilkenny final for the third year in a row. There's no doubt that these two teams are taking the game of Kukulin to new levels of skill, intensity and preparation. The last two finals have been two of the greatest games of hurling we've ever seen. And that's good, right? The beauty of Tip's performance last September was that Kilkenny didn't regress. Tip raised their game to a similar level maybe even surpassing that unprecedented standard. The concern is that these teams will continue to leave the rest of the field behind. But I completely disagree with people who think that these two teams will go on and dominate hurling for the next decade. Like the winds up here in the mountain, there are gusts, and then the winds of a county will slacken again. So where is the next gust coming from? This Kilkenny team has been the greatest that ever lived. Their players are legends, but change will come and there will be a totally different Kilkenny side. Dublin's arrival as a genuine force has also shown how the landscape has changed. Clare won back-to-back Munster minor titles this year for the first time in their history. Waterford have been more competitive at underage than at any time since the mid-90s. Cork will struggle in the next few years, but they have a quality under-21 team this year. In about three or four years' time, Hurling will hopefully have returned to the halcyon days of the 1990s, when at least three or four teams will have genuine ambitions of winning an All-Ireland. So like me and this puck father, Waterford or Dublin may not win a trophy this year. They may even be outclassed over the next couple of weeks. But they will learn about where they need to get to. And over the winter months, that experience will drive them to become better, faster and stronger for next year. The cycle just keeps going. It never stops. Christy O'Connor there, and well done to Tipperary goalkeeper Brendan Cummins, who added another All-Ireland to his collection, winning the puck fodder for the fifth time. Dennis, what do you think? Tipperary and Kilkenny, will they continue to dominate? Um, certainly for the next year or two, I think. I mean, I, I, I take Christy's point that over the next ten years, or even the next five years, you can see some of the teams emerging again that we saw in, in the late 90s, you know, being hugely competitive. Uh, I think his point is well made that Kilkenny didn't regress the whole pile last year, maybe not, not at all. During their four in a row, their average winning total was 28 points. Tipperary scored 29 points to beat them in mm. the final last year. That was the target that Kilkenny set. Tipperary beat that target. So it was, it was Tipperary who had made you know, the big jump and a fantastic jump. I think the big thing that has um, characterised Kilkenny and Tipperary is that they're, inno they're both innovators in different ways. The Cork team that came before them were innovators in their puck-out strategy, in their possession game. The Kilkenny team, their biggest in innovation was their defensive setup, which was for hurling was was you know a real breakthrough for, for any hurling team to put so much thought into their defensive structure. 
Tipperary, it's all about attack, attack, attack. And they're, they're a forward line, and the way they play, and the way Eamon O'Shea coached them over the previous two or three years, has taken, has taken forward play to a new level. And it's up to, now to, the next, it's, it's up to the next team to come along, whether it's Galway or Warford or whoever, Cork, to, you know, to match that and find something, else, find something new themselves. And do you feel, David, as a, as a member of the Galway hurling squad, that the gap is widening, that it is getting longer and longer? It, you know, it's, it's a difficult question because if you look back at last year, we were not far off beating Tipperary that, like by a point. It didn't go our way. Ball didn't break the right way for us. Look, at, I think there's a gap there, yes, but I don't think it's that big that we can't bridge it. As you said, the renovation to change, uh, if, if other teams can pull along with that. Like we worked this year, I thought we worked very well against Cork with the short passing and the, and the possession game that we played. If other teams can bring that into it. Now, I can guarantee you that Waterford aren't going to go to <laughs> to Blake and Kenny the next day and, and kind of just give it to them. Yeah, They're going to have everything yeah. against them. Like, they had so much motivation after losing that game to Tipperary the other day mm. that they were out there and there were nothing going to stop them. Yeah. Now, we didn't hurl that well as a team. We didn't hurl well that day. But if you are given a carrot, you're going to go for it. And Waterford went for it. And mm. I can guarantee you they'll go for it again this weekend. But is enough being done in, in Waterford and Clare and Galway? The, the, the actual yeah, structures? Yeah, I, I think there is. Like, there's a, the underage structures that are there. Um, these guys going into schools. Like, I was in Sligo even the last weekend. And there's a... There's a dedicated team to coach young guys and young players, 12, 14, in primary schools. And that's all over the country. Yeah. And I yeah. think that is vital at the moment because hurling is dying a death in, I suppose, rural areas and even in city areas. Like in Galway myself, there's not that many. Our local schools aren't getting as much hurling as they used to get. So I think it's vital that it's done at under 10 all the way up. Mm. And I think the GA have to put money into that. Well, Warford, Warford Marty are well organised on their age and done really well in school stuff mm. for the first time in a long time. You know, in recent years in Hearty Cup and so on. Clare were a disaster with their 90s success. Yes. They didn't. They absolutely wasted. It, it was wasted. Mm. It's only in the last few years that Clare have got their act together on their age. And as Christy was saying, won back to back minors. But there was a huge last opportunity there. And the same in Wexford. It's only in recent years that they're starting to get it right. Well, why can't teams, sorry, no for interrupting, why can't teams bring it up from minor under 21 to win at senior level? Mm -hmm. It's a prime example from Galway, like. Yeah. And Limerick, exactly, back in, the, back in the years when they won three All-Ireland under 21 titles. Yeah. And Morris, what about the mentality of weaker teams? I mean, I know you're involved with Limerick. You were obviously wear the Munster Championship in terms of the football. But overall, whether it be football or hurling, how difficult is it for the mentality of teams that they see all the, the big guns going further and further ahead? I think they see, the likes of Limerick now see Kerry and Cork driving each other on, you know, uh, Tyrone and Kerry were driving each other on earlier on the decade, um, in the last decade, and you know Limerick, you know, just I suppose they're, they're trying to you know trying to reach that standard. They're very high standards they're trying to reach, but you just you're just taking you don't look at the bigger picture nearly. You have to kind of look at just the game that's coming up. How you're going to you know, to target matchups, target you know try and find um, weaknesses if you can in, in teams like Kerry, and you just you just take it. It doesn't seem as daunting when you're preparing for it, even though mm. they are a daunting team to play. Um, but you just have to, you have to, fo you have to give, you have to focus on things, try and break it down and, and, and attack it that way. Dennis, you wrote a book about the, the great days of the, the hurling of the 90s. Mm. Is that possible for it to happen again? That it would be a real competitive championship? Uh, I think it is possible. I mean, clearly, we've only had one of those in the last 50 years. I mean, the 50s there was an element of that. The 90s were kind of unique. Or it wasn't even the whole 90s, Marty. It was only four or five years. Mm. I mean, people forget that. I mean, the, the 94 was a disastrous championship. Yeah. 95 to 99 were great, and I think people. Judge this, judge every championship since in that context to a certain extent. And when you see two teams like Kilkenny and Tip dominating, you think, crikey, where, where, have the, where have those days gone? But those days were only there for a few years. Yeah. I think they can come back. And I think Clare and Waterford, and you, know, you, you can see, as Chris was, was saying, you can see in two or three years' time, and Limerick, that there are teams coming back. But um, the standard has gone through the roof. I mean, uh, those, uh, the, uh, the last two Ireland finals, I mean, unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable. But I think the tackle count in the hurling final last year. Like the hurling tackle count is usually a lot lower than the football. There was the same hurling to count that year. Yeah. That's how in, that's how intense it's got and how yeah. physical it's got. So the standard is raised. So are we being a little bit too negative? Uh, uh, Tipperary and Kilkenny are they the best two but teams? Isn't that ever? always the way with Irish people? We're a negative <laughs> as a team. Like, <laughs> we need we have to bring it to a positive side and look at kind of drag the positive out of positive out of it and bring it on from here. And and let's not stay with that. Oh, this is going to be a disaster. This is going to be everything has a, has runs this time and I think that it will come around again. Teams want to get there. Like we're training five days a week for the last nine months. You know what I mean? And that's when we're not there to just participate. We're there to win. But the other key point is that in the late nineties, Cork, Kilkenny, and Tip went through a fellow periods where they just weren't going well. Kilkenny and Tip are not going to go anywhere. 
their structures are right now. They have, they have a conveyor belt. So it's up to other teams to reach that standard, not wait for them to come back, because yeah. they, aren't, they aren't coming back. To, we have to get there. Okay, let's see what happens over the next few seasons. Now, as we said, Kilkenny faced Waterford in the first of the All-Ireland semi-finals on Sunday. Both teams come into the game in fine form. Yes, a bit of a reaction there with some of those highlights, particularly a Waterford goal. Let's talk indeed about Waterford first, uh, Dennis. Is the rehabilitation over for Waterford, or is there still a little bit of that mental hangover as a result of that thrashing in the Munster? Um, no, I think they're I think they're okay. I mean, Kilkenny is a whole different issue whether they can be whether they're good enough, whether they can cope with that challenge. I mean, certainly the last day they played, they their defensive system that they had used for the previous couple of years was set aside, and it was more back to the kind of the kind of structure and performance that we've been that we've known from them under Justin and so on. Um, whether that's good enough the next day is a different question. Straight question, David, to you before you <laughs> keep going. <laughs> were Waterford that good or go or Galway that bad? And Waterford hurled well. Waterford were good on the day they were. We didn't we didn't play to our standards, we let them hurl and just going to their game plan, they seemed to drag out their half forward line two corner forwards out and left so much space. Mm. And that was a serious plan and it worked. Waterford were were on form. They had their homework done on us, and you can't take it away from them. I think it was a very re emotional response from um, yeah. from Waterford. You know, because even just the pictures after the match there again will remind you of it. But uh, I think that to, that's no good for the weekend. You know, it's a long bat. It's long going to be a long you know uh, match, and these can't get burnt out. You know, or it, if, if if things drop or things don't go their way, you know, they they have to just stick in there and, and keep fighting because. You know, they just won't live off the emotion against a team like Kilkenny. Mm. How do you prepare a team, though? You know, from a management point of mm. view, when you're taking on a big gun like Kilkenny, yeah. do you tell them, look, you've nothing to lose, you've achieved as much as you can, or do you say, lads, we can win this? You just, you just, again, I mean, you're trying to get a good start always, first of all. You don't want the game to be over after 10 or 15 minutes. That's what we would, when we played carrying the Gaelic grounds this year, that's, that's that what happened to us. And it was, it was you know, you're, sitting, you're on the sideline, 15, 20 minutes gone in the game, and you're saying, what can we do here, you know? And carry your coast and popping the ball around the place. I think Waterford needs to think about that the next day as well. How are we going to stay in this game? And the longer it goes on, you know, they just might, you know, get stuck in a bit of luck at a few breaks. And it's it's very difficult. And and any lapse of concentration, you know, the five minutes before half time, the five minutes after half time, all those areas, you know, Davy's going to have to make sure that those people that they're all tuned in for those times. And if you know, you just can't turn off for any any length of time during the, during these games. You know, are Kilkenny back at their peak, Dennis? Oh, I think they are. I think they are better than last year. Um, obviously, Shefflin is back in one piece, which is fantastic for them. He's playing over his skin. Um, Colin Fenley has been a good find for them. Uh, Michael Fenley is flying. Michael Rice is flying in a different role. I mean, as a finisher, a guy who was, had a reputation always as a, a workhorse and a real team player. This year, he's there as a finisher, which is a, you know, an amazing change around for him. Um, I think they're in great shape. And Power is back as well. Oh, and Richie Power's playing over his skin, isn't he? Yeah. Oh. Like, Shefflin is a serious playmaker there. And once you have him in that fold, I think they're going to be a serious outfit again. Who's going to win it? Kilkenny should win it. How about Joe Morris? Good Kilkenny. mayor, man. Limerick Kilkenny. manager. <laughs> Kilkenny. Kilkenny on Sunday, yeah. Unanimous vote. Kilkenny to win the All-Ireland semi-final. OK. In the football championship, two all-rivals, Dublin and Tyrone, clash for the third time at this stage in recent years. And you can see that game live on Saturday. So there are more forwards than the two Brogans. But if you hold the Brogans, do you hold Dublin? Um, well, I don't think Bernard had his best match against Wexford, um, and um, you know, but Alan did step up to the plate. Um, Alan's having a great year. Bernard can just go off and score what he wants nearly. Um, but I think, I think what you know, they seem to have scores coming from everywhere. I mean, the, you know, wing back scoring fantastic goals. Um, I don't think I don't think any team really is reliant on one or two forwards anymore. I think that you know, basically from five upwards, they can you know you, you, you should be expected to be able to take a score. Mm. Um, is Mickey Hart playing my games there? I don't know. I don't think he really gets into that too much, you know. Mm. Um, he's, I think he's pretty genuine in his in his in his interviews. Um, so, you know, it's it's a it's a great game for Tyrone. It's the one they want, you know, to get them back on track. Did does Tyrone have kind of slipped quietly through the back door? Are they back to their best? Have they? Has Mickey Hart got the mix right now? Yeah, it's hard to know if they're back to their best. I mean, because the best players from the last decade that they had can't be at their best now because, you know, they're, they've had so many miles in the clock, they're in their early 30s and so on. It's not possible for them to be at their, at their peak. Mm. Um, they were, uh, they haven't played, they haven't produced a performance yet that will win the All-Ireland. But 
they haven't had to win the other, you know, you don't win it in, you don't win it in June or July. Yeah. Um, this is a game I think that they'll relish. They feel they kicked it away last year. The Wides, they had so much of the possession, they looked to be winning that game handy. A goal at one end from Onogar, lucky enough goal off the, off the upright. Um, I think they'll feel that they left it behind them, and I think they'll feel that they have a, a point to prove on Saturday night. Plus they, felt, plus they feel they were, they were all fought in that game and all tackled mm. and all worked, and they, that won't go down well with those guys, so mm. you know, I, I, I expect it to be a very intense battle. So you think the psychological advantage is with them then? I do, I think they've got everything to prove, you know, they've mm. got it, you know, they're, they're going up there playing the dubs, all, every team loves playing the dubs up in Crow Park, and yeah. I think, um, you know, they're, they're, they're primed to be come out with all guns blazing. Let me talk about Dublin's layoff, uh, David, because Kilkenny have mm. had a five-week layoff like Dublin. How significant is that when you're going into a big match like this? I think when, the, when you have that much of a layoff, you've got a lot more time to perfect your game, uh, your strategies, your tactics, everything like that. Those Dublin guys are going to be fresh and ready to go while Tyrone have a good few games played. Um, it, it suits some teams. I think it suits, like, it'll suit a team to, to have a two-week layoff and then go straight into a game. Whereas other teams might like to play a game yeah. before the week four and get really into the groove. I don't think it's going to affect Dublin too much. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect Kilkenny. Like, Kilkenny's aim at the start of the year was our aim. Win that Leinster, get six weeks break, and then you're straight into the Ireland semi-final. That is the point. Kilkenny have never complained about that break, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's a super break because if you, you can throw your kitchen sink at it and get injured. If you get injured, so be it. But if you get injured and you've only one week layoff, your team is losing. And mm -hmm. look at Cork, they lost a lot of players like that. Yeah. So... It kind of suits. It would suit. It would have suited, suited uh, Kilkenny down to the ground with six weeks layoff. So I don't think it's any problem. Dublin playing in Croke Park has often been used as you know as a, a, an extra advantage. But is it not a motivating factor for teams like Tyrone to come to Croke Park to the best arena of all and take on the Dubs? Well, it's definitely a motivating factor, and, and teams like Tyrone and, and Kerry especially feed off that. They really, really enjoy the atmosphere and thrive on it. And. Uh, it's always a test of them, and some, some of the best football has been played against the Dubs in Grove Park. I can think of some of the goals that Colm Cooper and, and, and Owen Mulligan have got that have been outstanding goals. And um, I think it's, it's, you know, it's probably a disadvantage for the Dubs in one way, but at the same time, if they ever do get over it and they do start winning these big games and get into semi-finals semi -finals and finals, that, that's when they'll really, you know, they'll, they, that's when they, they get... seriously suffer at this stage, like. Yeah. yeah. In Grove yeah. Park, under that pressure, under them lights. This is a huge game for Dublin, Marty. It really is. I mean, if, if Dublin are the team that they think they are or want to be, this is a game that they must win, that they must go and dominate. Well, not even just so much dominate, but just get it done. They must get it done. So, Dennis Absolutely. Walsh, Cork, uh, Cork. I obviously <laughs> think of Cork when I talk to you. Dublin or Tyrone? Tyrone. Tyrone, Marty. Tyrone. I'd say Dublin, I think, this time. Good man, just to be a little just bit Just to different. be a bit of a... Excellent. <laughs> OK, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Of course, you can see highlights of both the weekend games.